Hi everyone, welcome to this session on Launch Your Career. This is a session uh, especially for final year students at York St John um, or postgraduates who will be leaving us very shortly and this session is aimed to to prepare you for the next stage of your uh, your life your next challenge the next step after graduating from uh, york st john university so as i mentioned you are very welcome and thank you very much for joining us for this session so as i mentioned this session really is a is a wraparound uh, session to give you i suppose everything that you you might need to take that step moving forward. So what we're going to do, we're covering um, basically by the end of this session, you should be able to um, develop your understanding of some career theories and apply this to your own career planning and decision making. Sometimes um, getting started can be really tricky. It can feel like the hardest thing just to just to start moving forward. So hopefully this session will give you some theories and some tools for you to use to help you to take that first step uh, moving forward with career planning and career decision making. You'll also be able to recognise the role of self-awareness and personal branding in career planning as well and really understanding who you are and what you're wanting from your career. And finally, building confidence and familiar familiarity, easy for you to say, uh, with uh, the recruitment and selection process as well, because it's it's all well and good as helping you to um, to figure out what you're wanting from your career and then recognising who you are and what you want. But also we need to recognise that it's, it's a relationship. There is you, but there's also an employer, for example. So really understanding what the recruitment process is so you can prepare accordingly to uh, to really wow that employer. And I suppose um, in a lot of ways, we'll touch on this a little bit later, uh, things like job interviews and applications. Obviously, it's, it's human nature, obviously, within those um, two processes to focus on yourself a lot. And actually, it's about understanding the employer as well. So we'll give you a few tips and tricks on how to, to balance that and write a really good quality application as well. So as this is a pre-recorded session, um, I've put there, let us know what you'd like to gain. Uh, if there's anything after the session that you think, ah, oh, that we should have covered, that, oh, that would have been really helpful, uh, do drop us an email to careers at yorksj.ac.uk um, or you can book an appointment on Launchpad Online with a careers advisor. I'll be really happy to tailor um, what we cover in that session towards your individual needs as well. So the first thing I want to start with is this question, what can I do with my degree? And actually it's a really common question that we get asked a lot within the career service in one-to-one -one appointments and in sessions. Um, and it's a really interesting question. It's a really valid question. What can I do with my degree? And this is what you might be thinking about uh, at the moment, thinking about your future career path. What can I actually do with this degree that I've studied towards at uh, York St John? So what I'd like you to do is pause the video just for a couple of minutes and ask yourself the following question. What do you think you could do with your degree? What ideas do you currently have? So get a pen and paper and write down as many ideas as you can of what you could do with your degree. So get a pen and paper, pause the video and write those things down. OK, so hopefully you've done that activity and you may have a big long list of, of uh, possible job roles. You might have a really short list. It might be really tricky because um, it is tricky thinking about uh, job roles and what you might be able to do with your degree. But I want you to let I want to let you into a little secret. And that is you can do pretty much pretty much anything that you want with your degree. Now, that doesn't mean that you can take your degree in your current form, for example, a degree in English language linguistics and go and become a, a, a GP or a doctor tomorrow because further training might be required or retraining might be required. But what I'm trying to get across is that for the majority of roles, majority of employers, so 86% of graduate employers are degree agnostic, which means they don't really mind what degree you've uh, completed as an undergraduate. Uh, provided you've got the right skills and attitude approach and, and approach to the role that they're advertising for at the moment. Now, as you can see, 86% is the vast majority. The, the exception will be the 14%. The other 14% are usually in STEM roles, um, so more sort of uh, technical roles. 
Um, so that's where medicine might come in for that, where actually a, a relevant degree and experience is important. But for the majority of graduate employers, 86 uh, percent, they don't really mind uh, what degree that you've got. So actually you're in the driving seat and the destination is, is flexible. And just one example to demonstrate that is that uh, Fujitsu, obviously you might have seen like Fujitsu cameras, like they're, they're huge in the sort of digital and tech uh, industry. And you might expect that all, of, all the uh, graduates that apply to the roles at Fujitsu would be from a technical background. But actually their graduate of the year last year was a fashion graduate. So it just shows that if you have um, the right approach, the right attitude, the right skills, um, to to apply and to put yourself forward for a particular role there's no reason why you couldn't be shortlisted and subsequently interviewed and secure that role moving forward so again that's where you are in the driving seat and i suppose it almost it, again it puts a little bit onus on yourself in terms of you if you are applying for a role with, with a sort of a seemingly unrelated or less related degree um background it really just put the onus on yourself when you are applying for roles in lots of different sectors um to to articulate those skills so the eight the, the fact that 86 percent of graduate employers uh are, are flexible and degree agnostic doesn't mean that you can't just apply with a sort of an unrelated or seemingly unrelated degree um, and everything will be fine it really just put the onus on yourself to sell yourself within your um application but certainly at the start of that process that when you are thinking about your career moving forward some key questions that i would encourage that you ask yourself is uh, what are you interested in what are the areas that you you would be interested in exploring further could you take elements from your degree elements sort of modules that you've studied or for example if you've done some part-time work or an internship is there anything that you could take from that in terms of your interests what are you good at? This is a really, really difficult question. What are you good at? Because it's sort of, oh God, it's a bit cringe, isn't it? What am I good at? What things am I, do I really respond well to? But think about, think about things, think about skills or experiences that you feel that you've done, you've, you've got really good results with, or you've been really energized or motivated by. Or think about some feedback from managers, from colleagues, from academics, from uh, career advisors, I don't know. Um, think about any feedback that you've received and that could give you some insight into what you're what you're good at as well. What do you enjoy doing? So hopefully work, whatever that might be, whatever your career might be, um, should be enjoyable, hopefully, um, should give you sort of energy, should motivate you. Um, we spend a third of our life at work. Um, so it's really important that we find something that we we do enjoy um because we do it for such a such a big chunk of our life so if it's something that we enjoy and motivates us i can't say it won't feel like work but it'll feel less like a like a laborious task it'll feel much more enjoyable and, and fulfilling fulfilling i imagine and think about what your own version of success is because as individuals not to get too deep uh, too too soon too heavy um but we're all very different. What success means to each of us is, is really different. Some of us might be, might be motivated by salary, some might be motivated by uh, development, some might be um, sort of motivated by the support that they get from their manager and the, the sort of the, the feedback and the recognition of the work that they do. Others might not really care what they're doing or how much they're earning as long as they can support a certain group of people, for example. So think about what your version of success is uh, before you even get started, because it's, it's it's important for you. If you start with you, you've almost got a criteria to stick to when you are considering job opportunities moving forward. And this sort of uh, leading on from that and sort of reframing that question, uh, what can I do with my degree? Think about like what uh, skills and strengths that you develop from your degree as a starting point. What skills and strengths have you developed from elsewhere? So, for example, work, uh, when you, when you jobs that you've had, placements that you've done, any clubs or societies that you've been part of or any other aspect of your life as well. Think about the skills and strengths that you've developed. A lot of people ask me sort of, well, what, Matt, what is the difference between skills and strengths? What is what what is the what makes a skill a skill and a strength a strength? Um, and I think skill, skills are pretty much sort of more straightforward. They're things that maybe you can do or you can know, sort of attributes that you have. So compared to that, what are strengths then? Well, strengths can be uh, interpreted in lots of different sort of ways. Um, and lots of, if you look at the theory, 
um, of, of sort of strength and different sort of um, academics that I've looked into uh, strengths. There are lots of different sort of interpretations of what strengths are. Personally, I, I sort of um, subscribe to the Lindley et al. Uh, definition of strengths, which is basically uh, performance, energy and use. OK, so a, a strength is a skill that performance you, you are good at, you do well. Energy, so motivates, so it's also a skill that motivates us and energizes us. And finally, use, so something that we do a lot or something that is we, we've been able to repeat and, and, and uh, become familiar with. So a skill, pretty straightforward in terms of what a skill is, but a strength is a combination. So all of these three performance, energy and use. OK, so that could be useful when you are thinking about your skills and strength. And once you've mapped out your skills, look at the list of skills and consider which of the skills could be strengths. And think about which roles might enable you to apply and further develop these skills. So we are we are not sort of a blank slate equally. We're, we're not finished yet. We're not sort of a we've got an infinite amount of time and energy to develop new skills. And one uh, sort of key point from um, the 86% of employers being degree agnostic. Um, they don't mind what degree that you've got, but if you've got a real good focus on your, your own development, that you are reflective, that you can think about the skills that obviously identify the skills that you're good at, but also identify the skills that you're not so good at, the areas for development, that's, that's great. That shows that you're reflective. It shows that you are able to identify areas for growth and then find opportunities to develop those areas uh, further. So again, these are just three areas of starting point that you could uh, consider. And as I mentioned before, it's about reframing the question. So it's not necessarily about asking yourself, what can I do with my degree? Although that is a valid question. But what I would encourage you to do is to ask yourself, how can you utilise your degree to do what you want to do? And by putting yourself right in the centre of that decision making and really understanding what success means to you, you're able to then look at opportunities with through, through different through a different lens with a fresh pair of eyes okay putting yourself right in the center of that decision making and one thing that ISE which is the Institute of Student Employers recommend uh, and I would support that as well is that you focus your time and efforts on finding roles that you think could be a good fit for you or you would be interested in in in, in taking further and, and undertaking and and moving forward with because it can be really tempting to panic apply I mean I've been there I've been a graduate as well and um, I felt as though oh, God, what do I need to be applying for where do I need to be um, my friends have secured something I've not oh I'll just apply for a hundred jobs this weekend now what that'll do that'll do two things that by applying for a hundred jobs over a weekend it means that the quality of your applications will drop massively okay because you've gone for quantity over uh, quality okay so what i would say is one of the key things is to um to focus on the quality because even if you applied and this is I'm, I'm sort of this is an exaggeration really but you could potentially get a better result from 10 really good quality tailored applications than 100 applications that you just clicked quick apply for that you're not really interested in okay so that's what you're looking for quality over quantity and the second point that i wanted to make is that you will be absolutely knackered by the end of that point you, you by applying for a hundred jobs over a weekend you will burn yourself out so so quickly okay and that is not sustainable for the future and also it, if you do a hundred jobs over I mean first well done I'm not well done but meaning congratulations for doing that because that's an incredible feat but it's maybe instead of thinking instead of working harder work smarter and that's what I would encourage you to do so avoid although it's an incredible feat avoid uh, applying for 100 jobs over a weekend and instead take a step back and think about what jobs could be could be well suited to you uh, and what could be worth your time and effort as well um, because you don't know obviously you don't want to waste the employer's time but also don't waste your own time focus on jobs that you think could be a good fit for you and local labor um uh, lo local uh, sort of labor market information tells us that we don't need to panic okay job advert adverts are at 94 percent at the moment of pre-pandemic level so one of the biggest sort of myths and fake news that exists at the moment is that a lot of people are saying well there are no jobs 
there are no jobs at the moment with a pandemic or we rather coming out of a pandemic there are there are no uh, jobs at the moment and it's, and it's not true um so we are at 94 percent of what we were uh, pre-pandemic um although some i will say although some um uh, sort of sectors and industries are recovering slower than others actually some industries and sectors are really thriving um as well i mean just one example um a local a local cheese shop uh, in york uh, before the pandemic just had the one shop that's what they're operating they did great cheese they had great, great service um and during the pandemic they were faced with a real problem because they had to close no one was able to come and visit the shop. So what they did, they diversified and actually started doing cheese and wine tastings at home. Now that rocketed during the pandemic. I also ordered a couple of boxes. I did it. They were great events. Now what that has meant that that, that that business is continuing to offer that service after the pandemic and actually has taken on more staff in order to fulfill that new service. So actually some industries are really thriving um, again, things like supply chain of, of sort of uh, supermarkets, for example, are they're, they're focusing more on sort of um, they've had to really respond and thrive to what's been quite a tricky uh, and difficult time. Um, so, like I say, it's not that it's not there are jobs out there, but exploring and really checking out what jobs are available is, is a good starting point. Um, and the last thing there, in, in February 2021, uh, online job adverts for Yorkshire and North East exceeded the February 2020 average level. So just before the pandemic, actually, there are more job uh, online job adverts now than there were before uh, the pandemic. And what I would say is, um, yes, more people may be applying for those roles because some people have had to put their career plans on hold for the time being. But that's out of your control. We can't we can't help that. We can't help that more or other people are applying. What I would say is focus on what you can control, and that is you writing a really good quality application to send off. Okay, and we'll be covering that a little bit later in this session. So moving forward, thinking about the next stage of your uh, career path. There are lots of different approaches when you think about uh, careers theory. And I'm not going to talk too much about careers theory because we don't need that right now. I don't need to glaze over. I don't want to lose you. Although we get really excited as careers advisor about careers theory. Uh, I'll just tell you what you need to know in terms of a, sort of a working knowledge because I don't want to lose you. Um, so there are a few different approaches according to the sort of the careers theory of how we can approach that decision, decision making, how we can approach uh, moving forward. Um, and that's, I'm going to struggle to say this, differentialist, there we go, I didn't struggle, uh, developmental, structural and behavioural. Okay, and there's just a four, four ways of moving forward and approaching your sort of uh, decision making. And there's not one that's better than the other, there are just different approaches moving forward. And what I would say is maybe pick elements of each of these or pick one and try it. And if it doesn't work for you, try a different one. Now, the differentialist is around personality matching. So thinking about, as a starting point, what types of job would my personality be suited to? So again, as a starting point, if you recognise what your skills and your strengths are and who you are as a person, that could be a good way of matching that. Looking at what, look at the person specification of job roles, what kind of person are employers looking for and seeing where you're matched in, 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 in that way. Developmental, so emphasis on self-concept, which changes over time and develops as a result of uh, experience. So this particular approach identifies career development as, as lifelong, a series of mini decisions, not just one choice. And what I would say is um, the most recent statistic is that people have six or seven careers in their lifetime. Now, that's not just six and seven six or seven jobs or roles this is separate careers moving forward so gone are the days where you would join a company at i don't know 16 and work there until you're 66 and then retire and that's it you and done done and dusted actually the developmental approach uh, emphasizes you trying different things and developing quite a diverse uh, range of skills and this is linked to um non-linear career paths and also portfolio careers, which is if you imagine uh, you are applying for a job and you've got experience in a few different roles, a few different sectors, you've had a few different careers behind you in quite diverse uh, settings, and you're applying for, for a job that someone else who has only ever worked in that sector, so you're both applying for the same role, you've got diverse experience, they've got quite narrow experience and uh, 
particular experience from, from one sector. Actually, you will have a much more diverse range of skills because you've de developed them through, through different roles and different career paths. Um, but also you'll offer different things with so different perspective, for example, a different approach. You might be able to approach the problems that you would encounter or the, the, the challenges that the, the organisation are currently account, uh, uh, encountering with a different through a different lens or a different hat on. OK, so you might have tackled a problem in, in an unrelated job previously, but you can use that learning and that knowledge to solve this new problem in a new sector. There's something that maybe the person who'd only ever worked in that one sector would really struggle with. OK, so again, it's developmentally it's about how you can make the most of each experience that you undertake and knowing that you don't need to know right now what you want to do for the rest of your life. That, that sort of thought makes me feel a bit ill, actually, knowing one thing that you want to do for the rest of your life, because as we go through life, as I've mentioned, our priorities change and therefore it's really important that we're able to flex and change with that. And as we go through life and our priorities differ as we go along, it's thinking about how we can use that understanding of ourselves to then when we are looking for job opportunities, considering which jobs fit our new sense of purpose or a new, our new approach or what our priorities are right now. You've also got the structural approach, so emphasises sociological factors. So th thinking about like education, labour market, socioeconomic status, thinking about, for example, what opportunities, if we're going from sort of uh, labour market and geographical, thinking about what opportunities are available in the geographical area that I want to work in. So, for example, if you want, and I'm being a bit facetious now, but if you wanted to live and work in York because that is a great city that you love, but you're interested in being, becoming a lighthouse keeper, well, we're miles and miles and miles away from the sea. So that's never going to happen. OK, so it's think maybe through a structural lens, you can think about the elements that are important to you um, and think about the, 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 the sociological factors that are affecting that, those choices. So if you want to stay in a particular area, look at lo lo local, easy for you to say, local labour market information, look at the the um, sort of factors that are most important to you at that moment in time. If you're really flexible, and let's say, for example, um, you there are other factors such as, I don't know, um, your, your own sort of uh, local labour market information. It could be around your own interests. It could be around a particular uh, area. So, for example, if you wanted to work in a support service or work in education, actually, that's going to that, that sort of that fact is going to really uh, impact the jobs that you then apply for. OK, so structural is around the, the factors, so thinking about what you are hoping for and the factors that might affect that uh, as well. And the last one is around sort of behaviour. OK, so thinking about um, what you feel, uh, what basically what success means to you um, and also thinking about how um, what your approach is, how confident you are, how able you are to, how able you feel, sorry, not able you are, how, how able you feel to move forward to that particular career path. So thinking about things like um, your own experiences. So how have you developed your own confidence um, within the experience that you've got? But also how have you developed confidence and knowledge through vicarious experience as well? So through role, role models, if you know somebody who works in a particular sort of sector or career path, the knowledge that you've gained from them as well. OK, so think about your own sort of self-efficacy and belief in yourself to move towards that particular um, uh, career path. And also in terms of encouragement and addressing barriers that come, come, you come up against as well. So thinking about behavioural in your own behaviours, what support or opportunities can you seek out to build your confidence and your self-belief and self-efficacy in career decision making? And that might be, ex might be exploring graduate internships. That might be exploring a particular sector to see if you like it. That might be talking to people who work in a particular sector to get more information about that so again it's about about developing your behaviors as an individual and like i say not not one of these individually is perfect because perfection doesn't exist um and there's no right and wrong draw from each of these or or try one and move on okay if it doesn't quite work for you or you'd like a second opinion okay so there's not not, not just one way of uh, applying this theory but it's really useful to know what the different theories are in helping you to to move uh, forward and what's really important is uh, with that sort of putting yourself right in the center of that decision making is um focus on self okay right at the start so as i mentioned before focus on you rather than uh, your degree alone 
and knowing that your degree is a part of you, but it's not the only thing that we need to be uh, considering. OK, now moving forward, as I mentioned before, actually, sorry, one second. I talk too much sometimes, I have to take a, take a, a breather and a drink. Um, knowing how to move forward can be really tricky um, and knowing even where to start uh, in terms of your next steps or your decision making can be really tricky. Now this is a tool, this is called the DOTS model, so this sort of cycle here is called the DOTS model. Now DOTS stands for Decisions, Opportunities, Transitions and Self. So as you can see, DOTS isn't in the right order, but SOD didn't have the same ring to it. Um, but because we always start with self, OK, we move around from self to opportunities, to decisions, through to transitions. OK, now this is the process uh, for a career development. Basically, it was um, invented or put together by Lauren Watts in the 70s at the, at the start. But we've been using it. It's been it's been sort of re-explored and re, re um rejigged since in terms of through different lenses to, as time has gone on and actually it's really stood the test of time really well it's a really great model for you to use now what the first step is is for you understand understanding basically who you are as a person so what i'd like you to do is to help you with developing your self-concept i'd like you to grab a pen and paper if you've not got one already and i'm going to give you i'm going to offer you a few questions that i'd like to write down that will support you to develop your self-concept and understanding who you are as a person. Because self-concept is a bit abstract. What is my self-concept? Who am I? OK, if I give you a few very specific questions, that should hopefully help you to get started um, with developing, developing your self-concept. Now, the first question we've already sort of come across, it's what is my version of success? OK, what is my version of success? The second one is, what does it mean to me to feel content at work? OK. The next one is, what are my priorities right now? What are my priorities right now? The next question is, what are my values and what do I stand for? There's only a few more questions. The next question is, uh, what are my skills and strengths? What are my skills and strengths? The next question is, what are my areas for development? The next question is, um, are there any other things that I need to consider? So things that don't quite fit into those those categories. It could be, for example, I don't know, health conditions, a disability, um, uh, responsibility outside of work. So, for example, family support. It could be location that you really want to sort of be in, in particular, uh, working style, learning style. Any sort of factors that are important to you that might not have been picked up on in the previous questions. Now, once you've done this, this will give you a really good. Uh, idea of who you are as a person and what you can then do is all, also if you've bullet pointed your answers reorder them in terms of importance to you so put your most important factors towards the top least important factors towards the bottom um, and you will have an idea then if you sort of after you've done that if you split that list into sort of informally into three the top third will be your likely to be your needs because they're the most important things to you the second third are likely to be your wants, so things that are important, but not quite as important as your needs. And then finally, uh, the, 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 the last sort of chunk are your negotiables, things that you could are important in the grand scheme of things, but you could trade off for an opportunity that you found really exciting. OK, so this is your self concept. Now, what you can then do at this point is put it to the side. OK, put this list to the side. We move around to opportunities. This is you looking at and considering any opportunity that you find, looking at your target jobs, your Indeed, your LinkedIn jobs, your Monsters, your jobs to ac.uk, Milk Round, uh, Launchpad Online, all the different job sites that you can think about, looking on prospects as well. Uh, you might, for example, for, for more specific roles, for example, medical, you might look at NHS jobs. So thinking about where the roles are that you are interested in or you might be interested in. And at this point, just making a list, going through, doing a bit of research into each role. And if you find a role interesting, that's the only criteria at this point we're using. If you find a job interesting, make a list, get it on your list, 
okay and keep adding to that list and maybe give it put a few notes next to it in terms of why you're drawn to that in particular because you might be able to if learn from if, if that role in particular isn't suitable for you what about it was suitable or was interesting how can we use that moving forward it's always about reflecting and learning moving forward so going through and thinking about any opportunities that you find interesting that's the only criteria at this point if you find a zookeeper lighthouse keeper i don't know all of these jobs write them down on a, on a on a piece of paper and you might end up with 10 20 30 40 50 different opportunities different kinds of job roles that uh, you're interested in the prospects job profiles are a really good place to look at as well for inspiration now you might think gosh matt that's a list of 40 jobs I'm, I've gone from having no ideas to 40 ideas. That's really overwhelming. Well, hold your horses because at this point we move around to decisions. We, this is the whittling down stage. OK, so what we do at this point, we get our list of opportunities and we bring back our self concept list and basically look for any commonality between the two lists okay ultimately which of these jobs can give you what you want because not all of them will be able to possibly okay so if for example you are looking for a nine to five money to five nine to five and that's most important to you and a lot of the jobs on your list are actually even weekend work that might not be a great fit for you you're in control of this okay so if you a sort of oh it's an evening and weekend job i really really like it it might be actually that even the weekend uh, sort of monday to friday nine to five sorry is around your is more a negotiable than a want or a need okay and therefore we can we can tailor accordingly but at this point decision making we can then whittle down our choices from let's say a list of 40 to a list of maybe five or ten okay? or, or even less perhaps now just underneath where it says decisions it says plan and set goals okay so this is you planning and setting goals for applying for those opportunities what do you need to do now okay but also asking yourself how how prepared are you right now to apply for those particular roles you might want to do a bit of research looking at four or five different advertisements current advertisements four or five person specifications for those roles and basically go through and, and ask yourself what, how do your skills and strengths match with what the requirements of the role are? If you meet 100% of the criteria, great, you can get applying. If you meet 80% of the criteria, that's fine too. Okay, you don't have to meet 100% of the criteria to apply for a role. Okay, because that 20%, the difference, could be your development within that role. And actually, if you apply for, if you always apply for jobs that you meet 100% of the criteria for, actually there's very little room to grow, perhaps. Okay, so even if you meet 80% of the criteria, that's fine. If you meet like 50% or 40% or 60% of the criteria, you might want to consider applying. I mean, I'd, I'd still support you and encourage you if you wanted to apply. But what I would say is manage your own expectations and perhaps think about what you could do in the meantime to, to develop skills further, aligned to the role that you're applying for. OK, so plan and set some goals might be around applying for roles. But plan and set some goals might be hold the phone. I'm not going to apply for this right now, but what I am going to do is identify the areas for growth and look at opportunities that I could do for the next 12 to 18 months in the meantime to help me to develop those skills. So when that job comes around again, I'm in a much stronger and better position to apply for it and then secure it. OK, and then transition to you. Like I say, you've planned to apply for the job. This is actually you seeking out and securing and applying for those jobs there. So hopefully that DOTS model will be a, quite a helpful tool in helping you to move forward and understanding what the, the different steps are that you could consider and hopefully making making the transition as smooth as possible. But what this also does, in addition to that, is that you are minimising your chances of a job not suiting you because you right at the start you've understood what you're looking for and how that matches with the job itself. And you're also minimising the, um, the uh, chances of you starting a job and saying, oh, it's not what I thought it was because you will have done your research when you were searching for opportunities and if you are a bit unsure like i say those um prospect job profiles are a really handy place to look because i mean if i can have a favorite section of a of a, a prospect job profile it's the what to expect section which is the good bits the bad bits the warts and all of working in that particular role or sector and it ensures that you are going in with your eyes open okay so you're minimizing the chance of of um, being surprised or finding that a job doesn't fit what you are looking for. So what I'd like to do now, just as a bit of an activity, is uh, for the next two minutes, so pause the video in a second, but what do you have to offer employers? What do you bring to the table? What I'd like to do is pause the video in a second, 
give yourself two minutes to write down as many skills and attributes as you can. OK, three, two, one. Okay, so how was that? Was it tricky? Was it easy to think about um, think about the skills that you've got? Was it a lot tricky, a little bit tricky? Um, if it was tricky, I always find it tricky to think about what skills I have because one, it's, it feels a bit cringe <laughs> thinking about what oh how what do I what am I good at or what are my skills? What are my strengths? Okay, but what I would say is it's it's a it's a fundamental part of of understanding yourself and applying for jobs is is knowing what your skills and strengths are okay and it will be much easier for you to sell yourself as part of your applications and understanding what kind of roles that you'd like to apply for if you know what your current skill set is so if you found that quite tricky um what you can do is undertake a skills audit now a skills audit might sound a bit boring i understand that it isn't the best name in the world however it's really useful in understanding what your skills are currently and um and also identifying areas for growth as well so as you can see on that little example on the screen you'll have a list of uh, of skills so in this one we've got teamwork and communication and lots of different examples and elements of each of those skills in there and you've got red amber or green okay and you basically give yourself a rag red amber or green a rag rating based on how confident you are about having that particular skill or being, being able to evidence that particular skill so if you come across a skill let's say teamwork and you think well i've worked at aldi or i've worked at costa and i've worked as part of a team for three years or two years i feel pretty confident about teamwork i can do it with my eyes closed you can mark that as green if you come across a skill where you perhaps think I've got some experience of that, but I could do with more experience, you can mark that as amber. And if you're thinking I've no idea what that skill is or I don't kind of have that right now, but I might need it, mark it as red. OK, and what you're aiming to do throughout this time and throughout the start of your career and throughout your career, actually, is uh, identifying areas for, for development and growth. That's the reds and your, your, your ambers. And finding ways of filling those gaps okay so even if you find and this is as i mentioned before about um how how closely you meet uh, the person specification for a role if you go through a person spec and you meet let's say 40 percent of the criteria why don't you do a skills audit against the person specification that you of the role that you'd like to apply for because then you will know what your areas for development are you'll know what your skills and your strengths are now at the moment you don't have to worry about or you can continue building on um, but it will allow you to identify what your reds and ambers are for that role and therefore you can then consider right I can't apply for that job or I'm not interested right now in applying for that role because I really want to get some more experience or develop skills further um, what skills do I need to develop and then you can consider the roles that are available so for example maybe a junior role or a slightly different role in, a, in, a, in, a, in the same sector or a different sector that will help you to fill in those gaps okay so you're not going in at a level where you're going to feel not prepared or uncomfortable but maybe another role that will help you to fill in the gaps to help you to feel more much more confident when you do come around to applying for that job moving forward and what you can do if you'd like a copy of a skills audit um, if you contact careers at yorkstj.ac.uk we'll send you a copy no problem at all okay now when you've completed your skills audit or your tailored skills audit if you get a a, a, a list of the, the person specification for a role and use that as well what you can do is you can you can continue as i mentioned to develop the skills that you do have so all those you've identified as green you can see seek out opportunities for growth such as like summer internships volunteering graduate roles uh, remember graduate roles are training roles okay so they are there to you, you don't need to know all the answers but have the right sort of approach and skills that they're, they're looking for as a minimum to help you develop those skills that you need to improve or the skills that you might not currently have you could discuss your skills audit with a careers advisor so you can book a 30-minute appointment what i would say about a 30-minute appointment is it's a good chunk of time but if you can use that time more effectively if you can do a skills audit before you before you come and then you bring that skills audit with you we can start uh, you can do all the sort of the, the 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 exploration beforehand and we can start off the bat we can start straight away on working through your skills audit and discussing that instead of doing a skills audit and wasting time within the within the appointment itself uh, take your skills audit along to the meeting with your line manager for example and inquire about opportunities to get involved with if you've got a job at the moment and you there's an opportunity to step up or an opportunity to take on more responsibility and that's in line with the areas that you'd like to develop don't be afraid to take that along and discuss that with your line manager if you feel able to do so 
And you can also use it to reflect on how you could use this insight, it's really useful, within your current imminent or future career decisions. And thinking about where you are at the moment, where you want to be imminently, and where you want to be in the future as well. And as I mentioned before, I've touched on it briefly about using person specifications and how you can complete a tailored skills audit. What you could do in that way is make a list of the types of roles that you would like to apply for or the sector that you'd like to work in as a starting point. Uh, think about the skills, attributes and competencies that are required or expected in the role or sector. This is where your person specification comes in. It also, if you've gone to an event or a webinar or uh, an employer talk or you've got feedback from, it, from an interview of skills that you know are important or, or are required or looked for or expected in a particular job role, you can include those in your list as well. And then what you can then do when you've, once you've got a list, you can create your own tailored skills audit that is reflective of the specific skills that are that are needed or required or looked for within the roles that you are interested in. That's where the tailored bit, the tailored skills audit in, and you know how clear you are to your, your goal. And it's recognising through this activity is that different skills are required for different roles. They say it's horses for courses, which means that different people different people have different skill sets and different skill sets require different skills and therefore requires different people. OK, and there are different roles for different people. So it's about finding a role that suits you best and a role that you're able to flourish and thrive in. So these are four examples. So academic researcher, marketing executive, youth worker and policy officer. OK, all of these roles will need different skill sets, skill, skill, sorry, skill sets. So what I've done, I've had a look on prospects, the job profiles there. And as you can see, there might be some overlap in terms of the skills, the transferable skills across the four roles. But actually, each of these roles have quite individualized requirements or skills that, that that would be useful within those job roles and this is from the skills section by the way of the of the, of the job profiles really really handy to take a look so as you can see so for example academic researcher we've got a high level of intellectual ability to plan and carry out research for marketing executive we've got creativity and an eye for detail for a youth worker we need the ability to establish good relationships with young people and patients tolerance and flexibility for example and policy officer could be around effective research analysis skills, including, including quantitative and qualitative, um, and also good political judgment and initiative for making decisions autonomously or advising others on the most effective course of action. So they're very different sets of skills. That doesn't mean that you can't take steps towards any of these roles, but it's understanding what the skills are required from the person specifications or the job profiles for those roles, measuring how close you are to, to meeting that criteria and if there are gaps finding out ways that you can fill those gaps okay so one example could be if you are interested in becoming a psychotherapist in a clinical setting you could research on prospects the british psychological society nhs jobs and guardian jobs for example for information on the skills attributes competencies that are required for those roles and then do a tailored skills audit and you might find that uh, you have from placements from work experience from from other other experience that you've got involved with you might have the ability to build rapport with others or i can do that with my eyes closed we'll mark that as green if for example you have the ability to work well um and think clearly in the pressure you've got elements of that but you you, you could do with more experience that could be amber and if you've never had experience as part of a multidisciplinary team mark that as red OK, so what I would encourage somebody in this scenario, and this is a fictional scenario, by the way, but what I would encourage somebody to do in this scenario is maybe think about before applying for a psychotherapist role within the NHS, for example, in a clinical setting, it might be that they find a role or consider finding a role um, that would help them to to build upon the red and the amber in the in this sort of traffic light system and making sure that you you sort of you feel as confident as you can be about the skills that you have and you're working towards further developing uh, the, your sort of your areas for development and building upon this recognizing and building upon the skills that you already have as well okay so this is just one tool you can use in terms of your sort of recognizing and building upon the skills that you have so once you've done that as part of that process because this is not just recognizing about recognizing the skills that you don't have because that's not helpful actually that will make you feel quite the opposite of confident very not unconfident or not very confident at all 
So what I would say is recognising the skills that you do have is also really important as well. And you will all have skills that other people don't have or the combination of skills that you have that other people don't have. So recognising what skills you do have is really important, but also being able to evidence those skills as well is really important too. So everything that we say we can do, we must be able to evidence, okay? So if we say, for example, oh, I've got a good project, I've got excellent project management skills, that's great. How can you demonstrate that, okay? So what I've done here is giving you an example of a key skills and personal attributes map, okay? Something that I found really useful within my career in mapping out the jobs that I've had and the skills that I've, I'm able to demonstrate. Um, so here, as you can see, this is based on me. This is not fictional. This is this is real life. I have been a sales, sales assistant in the start of my career. I then progressed to become a kitchen designer, believe it or not, and uh, I'm now a careers advisor. OK, so what I've done is I put my, put my name in the middle. I've mapped out all the sort of job jobs and experience that I've had. You could include other things like paid, unpaid work, volunteering, involvement with groups and societies, sports teams, academic involvement with modules and things, anything really. So mapping out all the experiences that you've got and then considering each one in turn and then mapping on that further, on that sort of mind map, what skills that you feel that you've evidenced during that period. OK, so what you could do is off the top of your head, think about some skills that you've identified what you could also do is do some exploration on the prospect's job profiles to get some ideas of what um, skills a kitchen designer needs. And therefore, you might think, oh, I didn't think of that one. And you can add that to your list. What you could also do is if you're applying for a particular job role or, or role in a particular sector or industry, what you could do is look at the requirements on the person specification. I can't mention that, but enough, by the way, the person specification is so important, OK? Um, to your application and your decision making before that. Uh, look at the person's specification and to get some ideas about the, the, the skills that you know that you need to evidence. And then what you can do is think, oh, right, well, problem solving is needed. Uh, where have I been able to solve uh, problems? Ah, well, when I did this, and you can add that on there as well. So having a key skills and personal attribute map is really helpful. So what I'd like you to do is give yourself five or 10 minutes, really, that you can pause the video and, and um, continue when you when you like what i would say is take some time now to pause the video create a mind map or a brainstorm uh, and map out all of your experiences and as i've mentioned once you've done this think about mapping out all the skills that you believe you've demonstrated or developed within each of them okay so give you at least give yourself at least five or ten minutes pause the video and then we'll get on with the rest of the session OK, so I hope that's been useful. And that's again what we're trying to do within this session is take you from something that's quite abstract. So self-concept, look at the types of skills and strengths that you have and what you are looking for from your career, trying to work towards understanding what employers are looking for and then how you can evidence that with real life experience. But as part of that sort of the whole journey of self-awareness, personal branding goes hand in hand. That's also really important as well. So it's asking yourself things like, how well do you know yourself? Okay, that's really abstract. Like, what do they mean by knowing yourself? Okay, what I'm going to say is a starting point. Write down three words that will best describe you. If you're struggling to come up with a word yourself, reframe it. Think about maybe your best friend or somebody at work or uh, someone on your course. If they were to describe you, how would they describe you best? OK, just take a minute or so just to write down three words that you think would best describe you. OK, so three words, which word would you pick? If I had to pick three words, um, and this is on the spot, by the way, I haven't written anything down, I would uh, hope that I would come across as approachable. I think I'm approachable. I hope so. Um, I think I am quite, I've got a good sense of humour, so I would say funny. Once I, hmm, that's a bit cringy to describe myself as funny. I think I've got a good sense of humour anyway. It's a good sense of humour, uh, approachable and uh, trustworthy, I think I would say. Okay, that would be my personal brand. That is three words to describe me as an individual. 
And personal branding is thinking about who you are and the roles that you occupy. So for example, those um, those three words that I use there could be applied to me in a, in, a, in a work setting, to me as a careers advisor, hopefully I'd be approachable, hopefully I'd be have a good sense of humor, and hopefully I would be a sort of trustworthy, but equally as a friend as well. I hope that my friends will try and make my jokes funny. I mean, sometimes I'm the only one laughing, but let's not talk about that. Um, but thinking about actually as a friend, I hope that would be trustworthy. I hope that somebody could share their sort of secrets with me and, and their concerns with me and their thoughts. OK, and again, in terms of approachable, I hope that I'm, I'm, I'm be good at making friends. OK, so think about if the three words that you chose will differ if you think about the different roles that we occupy in life. OK, now th what I mean by roles is if we think about Goffman's dramaturgical theory. So Goffman in this theory thinks of or considers life as theatre or life as a stage, okay? So if we think about our current roles, so what are our current roles at the moment? We might be a student or a graduate rather. Congratulations, by the way, if you're approaching graduation. Um, professional, a sibling, might be a friend, might be a colleague. Think about who your audience is right now. Who is out there in the audience with this particular hat on? It's probably employers, okay? So you might also be an applicant, okay? Think about the different roles that we occupy within the stage. Now, on the stage in theatre, when we are articulating our brand, articulating our sort of our characterisation, who we are as a person, we've got direct characterisation and indirect characterisation. So direct characterisation is what we tell an audience about ourselves or about the character. So how, how do we describe ourselves to the audience? And there's also indirect characterisation. So it's speech. So what do what do we say? What does the character say on stage? Action, so how does the character behave? Um, what is their effect on others? So how do other characters or colleagues or friends or siblings feel when they're with them? And looks, and when I say looks, I don't mean how attractive you are. I mean how you present yourself, okay, on the stage. Now, as you can see, the majority is indirect. So obviously telling the audience is one thing, but actually a lot of the sort of articulation of who we are as a, as a person and, and the, the the space that we occupy and who our role is and who we how we market ourselves is all is all indirect it's how we hold ourselves what we say how we say it how we hold ourselves so it's really important to consider all of these things uh, when you think about your self-concept and your personal brand okay and what I sort of sort of identify is personal brand is a cross section I think this is a, yeah the Venn diagram I'm thinking back to maths GCC Venn diagram uh, and it's a cross section of who you are, what you want, and what you have to offer. Okay. Now, if you want some support on some further support on sort of self discovery, you might want to look at the personality insight quiz on manage your future. And you might want to also go into our YouTube channel. If you go into uh, YouTube and, and type in search for YSJ Launchpad, you'll find our channel on there. And there's videos on Flourish and Thrive and recognizing your values as well. So lots of great resources available on, on there. But what I would say is spending some time on each of these sort of um, points is 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 a great starting point in recognising what your brand is and what you want your brand to be. So what I'd like to do as a starting point is to pause the video. I'm going to go through each of these questions in turn. I want you to pause the video um, and answer some of these questions. Which are the ones are most interesting? Which ones do you feel will be beneficial? Feel free to go through and answer all of these questions, but I'm going to read them now. Um, so you'd have to write them down. You can pause them on the on the on the video and you can write down your answers. So the first question is: how would I introduce myself professionally or personally? What would I like people to think of when they think of me? What would I like to think of when I think of me? How would my friends and family describe me? What are my values and what motivates me? What are the most important things to me as a professional and as an individual? What is my background and where do I come from? These are all key questions that are related to identity and who you are and is one key, key part of um, your personal brand and your self identity. So consider pausing the video at this point before we move on and answering these questions to help you to get started in mapping out what your what your personal brand and your self-concept is. So the second sort of bit of the Venn diagram is what do I have to offer? Another really important part 
of um, of your personal brand and your self concept. And knowing where to start again is really tricky. Uh, so I've given you some questions here that you can work through. So again, I'll read through them one by one, but feel free to pause the video and answer these questions in your own time. So who's my main audience at the moment? What would I identify as my skills and strengths? What is my biggest achievement to date? What am I most proud of about myself? What experience do I have? What is unique about me? And what characteristics have others complimented me on? Okay, so pause the video now in a second, I say now, in a second, uh, and answer those questions before we move on to the final part of the Venn diagram. And the final part of the Venn diagram is what are my ambitions? So again, really tricky um, to, to to answer, to identify. So I've given you a few questions for you to work through. Uh, the first one is, uh, what are my goals or plans for the future? What would I like my career to look like at this moment in time? If I could achieve anything, like big blue sky thinking, what would it be? What does my version of success look like? What kind of life do I want to lead? What do I want to be known for or known as? And what are my priorities right now? Some really interesting questions there. So feel free to pause the video and answer these questions to help you to build an idea of your self-concept. If you'd like some more information and guidance on developing your personal brand, you can listen to a, a podcast of ours on Ask Launchpad, um, which is available wherever you get your uh, podcasts. Um, the one in particular is this episode with Ariana Botti, who is a general manager for L'Oreal UK and Ireland. And she's a good friend of mine. She came into campus and, and delivered a session um, before before the pandemic. Um, and um, she, while she was here, we got into the, um, the, the the recording studio at York St John, and we recorded this podcast. Okay, and it's all about uh, Ariana's career and experience, but also her top tips that have been really useful within our own her own career about personal branding. Okay, so her tips, in summary, uh, but I would encourage you to go and sort of listen to the episode, is. Um, get in tune with your strengths, qualities and attributes and define your values. Really, again, it's about a self-concept, okay? Knowing who you are, what you've got to offer, what you bring to the table. Um, number two, understand where you currently are. So understand what your priorities are right now, where you are at the moment, what kind of opportunities that you are interested in applying for, what your next step might be. Project your vision. So don't just have your vision in your head, think about how you can talk about it hold yourself accountable think about how you can start taking that journey moving forward into start exploring and applying for those roles consider writing down a mission statement so what you're aiming for within your career what you're aiming for right now okay ultimately what you're hoping to achieve and again this links to the question what do you want to be known for or known as and what you want to achieve within your career think about writing down your mission statement and writing it down getting it down on a um a piece of paper, your notepad on a on your wall in your room, for example, and keep reading your mission statements and make sure that you're holding yourself accountable for that as well. When you are exploring opportunities to apply for or when you think about your career moving forward, think about how close you are in, to that mission statement and, and, and achieving that. And finally, live your brand. So your brand, when we mentioned before about life is a stage, I don't mean you're an actor or you're acting. I think I want you, I would, I would like you to or I want you to, to, to feel able to, to be your authentic self. This is about discoveries, identifying you as roles with different people, but not you inventing a character. Because what I would say is being authentically you and being 100% you is what employers are looking for. Okay, so think about how you can live your brand because the brand, who you are as a person, all the question, all the, sorry, all the answers to the questions that we just mentioned feed into who you are. It's about your identity. So living your brand as well. So not just in your professional life, but also in your personal life as well. But I would encourage you to um, to listen to Ariana's uh, podcast. It's a great, it's a great, uh, it's a great podcast, um, and she gives some really great tips and advice within it. 
So with that in mind, then, um, what I'd like you to do is, based on all the work that we've done in the session so far, I'd like you to have a go at writing your own mission statement. And it's, and it's your opportunity, as I've just mentioned, to outline your goals for the future um, and make a commitment towards achieving them. And as I mentioned, you could keep you could keep it wherever you want on a in notepad, uh, pin it to your notice board, or put it on your sort of professional portfolio or website. Um, and it's something that basically you are holding yourself to. It's something that you are wanting to achieve within your career, and you are you consider this when you are thinking about opportunities to take forward as well. So what I'd like you to do is give yourself five or ten minutes uh, to using the answers to the questions in the previous slides. Write the draft of your mission statement cons consisting of three. Uh, bullet points is what I'm going to say. You could write it short paragraphs if you wish, but I think bullet points at the starting point is, is probably much sort of straightforward and, and easy at this point. And I've included a handy template below. So what I'd like you to do is think about all the work we've done up until this point in this session um, and using this template. So I will, and then an action, for, who you'd like to do that for, by, well, how do you intend to do it? What skills do you, do you want to use to, and what is your desired result? So, for example, I will challenge the views of others for LGBT groups by using my voice to support equal rights of others. OK. Another example would be uh, if you start a new business, for example, I will make innovative artistic bakes for everyday customers so that everyone can experience the joy of beautiful cooking. OK, so take five or ten minutes, pause the video in a second to think about all the work done so far, your self-concept, your personal brand, what kind of roles that you're interested in applying for, how you're interested in moving forward, and try writing just three bullet points of, of your mission statement. Okay, so feel free to pause your video now. Okay, so further to your mission statement, uh, personal branding and LinkedIn. Okay, we're going to talk a little bit about how your personal branding can be applied to lots of different settings. So in this example, it's your online presence, so LinkedIn. So I've got some top tips here for communicating your personal brand effectively on the online platform LinkedIn. Okay, so the first one is professional profile photo. You can see here, she looks very approachable and happy, but she's got a wine glass in her hand. And often when we um, look our best, because obviously on your profile you want to feel confident and feel like you're sort of looking your best, often replaces what maybe, for example, if you've been to like a, a formal or an event, you might have like a wine glass in your hand or you might be taking a selfie. What I would say is try to be as professional as possible. So no selfies or wine glasses. Um, start your profile with a strong, impactful headline. Um, Try to be within your profile because a LinkedIn profile is almost a digital copy of your CV. OK, so try to be succinct, compelling and appropriate within your bio and your profile. Try to um, connect with at least 30 connections on LinkedIn because that basically is the is the number where your profile, you get more views. It shows that you are using your, your LinkedIn. So 30 is a starting point can be a good, a good place to begin. Try to build your professional network to join relevant groups and share content. Don't be a don't be a lurker. Don't be afraid to share some content on LinkedIn. Now, um, within social media and sort of online presence, they talk about sort of 99 one ratio. So according to the research, 90 percent of, of people uh, don't post regularly, don't contribute regularly on they don't post any content on um, on sort of social media. Nine percent uh, occasionally post every so often and it's only one percent actually uh, regularly contribute. So what I'd encourage you to do is, is to be a contributor, not a lurker. Like, share, post comments. If you've been to a session that you found really helpful or a webinar or you've been to a, a networking event and you found it really helpful, you got some really great advice, say that. Tag the person on LinkedIn. Say thank you. Recommend, share the Share the feedback that you, you received because that's helpful to others. You're contributing to um, your professional network. And for further information, um, we've also on our launch pad, the podcast, you've got episode 10, which is Do I Really Need a LinkedIn Profile, which is with social media expert Making Sang, uh, another great episode. So do check that out on, um, on where, where you get your, your podcasts search for Ask Launchpad um, and you can also look on our YouTube channel so if you search for YSJ Launchpad there's a video there 
on developing your LinkedIn profile uh, as well. So do check out those resources for tips on your LinkedIn. Again, think about sort of your social media as well. So consider creating a personal blog, online portfolio or WordPress site if you think it'd be helpful and have consistent branding across professional online platforms. So it might be if you've got your own business, it might be logo or theme, for example, and think about creating uh, engaging and relevant content to articulate your sort of interest and your um, your brand within your sort of online platform. Again, be a contributor, not a lurker. So write some short posts or updates after attending webinars, thanking speakers for their time and summarizing what your key takeaways were. And uh, finally, ensure that all of your content is consistent with your personal brand. As I've mentioned, it's all about you as an individual. So how can you articulate that within uh, within your sort of online profile and uh, online as well? And from online to in person, um, so um, body language, if for example, at a job interview or, or anything like that, when you are going to a networking event in person, remember uh, whether you're on stage or off stage, remember Goffman's dramaturgical uh, sort of uh, perspective, the spotlight is still on you. So start as you mean to go on, obviously be COVID safe, uh, but eye contact, firm handshake and smile. Um, uh, wear something that is professional, but also makes you feel really confident and is consistent with your brand identity. Don't feel that you need to wear a dusty suit or a boring suit. I mean, be professional, uh, but wear something that you feel represents you as well and makes you feel really confident going into that sort of uh, networking event or to that interview. And think about developing a 30 second elevator pitch to articulate your, uh, your personal brand and your mission, mission statement or your experience as well. So we're going to take a break for a few moments. We'll be back uh, shortly with the, the second half of the session. So take some time, pause the video, give yourself a bit of a break, and we'll come back and focus in more on practical applications.
Welcome back to this session. This is the final part of the session. It's been quite a long, uh, long, chunky session this one, so do apologise, but hopefully you've found it uh, useful. Now, um, this this part of the um, this session is around basically we're going to look back at the uh, dots model and expand further on um, the opportunities part. So basically understanding what opportunities are out there when you are doing your exploration and thinking about how you can explore them. So a couple of places that you could look are, as I've mentioned previously, prospects.ac.uk are a good place to, uh, to, to look. You can also um, get some inspiration from the I Could videos. Um, I think they're available on, on YouTube, but we can give you a link to those as well. Um, basically, it's, it's talks from people from within different roles from the industry and how they got into particular job roles, and that could be really uh, useful. You might want to attend uh, launchpad events so for employer insights, or have a look on LinkedIn and, and be nosy. Um, we always encourage curiosity, um, so, um, so do have a look at, at sort of LinkedIn profiles, um, maybe of people who um, have studied the same course as you at York St John, or have graduated a couple of years before you on different courses. Have a little look and get some ideas. Uh, look on some organisations' websites and social media. Uh, any current vacancies in the sector or job type that you're investigating. Uh, do a local search. So use good old Google. <laughs> reliable Google to find which organizations are geographic, geographic, geographically close, sorry. Um, so for example, if you are looking around in the York area, look around York, look at the, do a local search. Um, consider looking at professional bodies and associations, sector events. So for example, um, it, the ICAW, um, which is about chartered accountancy, if you think they're interested in that, they might run some events. So feel free to, to, to look at look at those. Uh, and also informational interviewing is really important. So that is around asking employers, talking to people, talking to your connections and your network to get as much information as you can from them. That will help you to decide how you proceed with your career moving forward and that could be something quite formal so that could be either by email it could be at an employer event it could be at a webinar or someone you meet during networking or it could be talking to somebody that you know uh, informally as well that you might might work in that industry be aware of what is drawing your attention or interest or putting off uh, building self-awareness okay think about what the challenges are at the moment for you and think about the ways that you can research, explore and find that inspiration moving, moving forward. A few sort of insights that we've covered already. So job adverts for, adverts for February 2021 are at 94% of pre-pandemic level. Uh, job adverts in the following sectors are above pre-pandemic levels. This is where growth has happened within these sectors of manufacturing, construction, transport and logistics, IT and science would advise you to look beyond what you think the jobs within these sectors might be. So for example, M&S might not just be shop floor work, you might think of M&S like M&S food and um, sort of being served as a customer. But what you might not think about is um, all the back office stuff. So for example, management, logistics, HR, for example, actually ideas for M&S food, for M&S clothes, design, creative roles, lots of different types of roles that exist within a business. And like IBM is not just about computer technology roles. So again, explore the different roles that are available. There's been a 17% increase in job advertisements that are flexible or working from home. So if you do find yourself drawn to that kind, that kind of role, that's great news for you, um, and it might be that moving forward, there's a bit more of a mix of uh, of uh, in person and at home working, even sort of moving forward. Uh, Ninety percent of the British Chamber of Commerce firms expect an increase in the size of their workforce this year. Ninety five percent of those firms are SMEs. There's been a real growth in smaller organisations. The cheese shop that I mentioned is just one example of an SME. So smaller firms are, are really um reacting well to that sort of growth during quite a tricky tricky time and over 60 percent of uh institute of student employers employ over 60 percent of ise employers uh report an increased demand for mental health support sort of digital virtual uh impact and what that's mean spend a lot of time at home um, and significant growth in the number of senior management roles referencing well-being okay so again companies are responding 
to the requirements uh, that have been sort of the recognised challenges as part of COVID and working from, from home. And that's been reflected in the jobs that are being advertised and available. So if that fits into your sort of your interests, again, that's might be something that's worth exploring uh, further. So um, opportunity research and exploration is a combination of your inspiration ideas for the future, but also informed decisions. OK, so it's not just one of these alone. It's you being inspired and thinking about what opportunities are out there and what you're interested in, but also using the dots market to make a really informed career decision as well. Now, we talk a lot about planning, planning careers, planning, planning decisions. And by sort of approaching it, approaching career planning in a traditional way. So traditional approach, we make career, uh, clear decisions. The process for career development is logical and systematic. We work through the process. Um, as we mentioned before, around sort of matching, uh, we, it could match the skills and interests to, that you have to a job and it allows you to narrow down the choices. But life doesn't always work like that. Life is sometimes really unpredictable. So um, Krumboltz, John Krumboltz, incredible name, uh, Krumboltz um, invented or recognised sort of um, uh, the happenstance learning theory, which basically focuses on the idea that some career decisions are not planned necessarily, but are rather based on serendipity, good timing and chance. OK, so you do have the flexibility to, for example, being in the right place at the right time and, and, and applying for jobs and seeking out opportunities in that manner. It doesn't always have to be planned. OK, but what I would say is it's um, it's important that you, you feel equipped to be able to respond to those chance uh, chance uh, circumstances. So planned happenstance embraces indecision. It embraces the, the fact that you, you're interested in lots of different things to so try different things out and see what opportunities come from that. Recognising that the future is unpredictable and uncertain. We can't plan for everything. OK, so having recognising planned happenstances is really helpful. Unexpected events offer opportunities. So as I mentioned before, in terms of COVID, what's been a really challenging and, and really, frankly, difficult time has actually created opportunities with, with a lot of businesses. And that's where if you are curi curious and it can be curiosity driven, that can be really uh, interesting for you to consider different roles that you, you didn't, you haven't heard about or new roles, but using that curiosity to really drive uh, your interest in those in those areas. And finally, it sort of adopts a flexible attitude in, to changing circumstances. And again, this is linked to sort of like a fixed mindset and growth mindset. If you've got a fixed mindset, that's really sort of you, you, you within certain lines and um, this is black and white and there's not really much flexibility where uh, sort of a, a, a growth mindset is around, you know what, we've I've, I've experienced challenging circumstances, unexpected things have happened, but actually I can be flexible. This is this is offered opportunity opposed to uh, too much sort of uh, negative negative effects. So again, being flexible and recognizing that yes, we can plan, but also you've got loads of flexibility to 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 use Krumboltz happenstance theory as well. So how can we turn that theory? How can we apply Krumboltz's theory into practice? So we can do certain things to increase the chance of positive things happening. So being proactive, attending events following your curiosity, asking questions and being flexible. OK, these are all things that I would encourage anybody to undertake and to, to, to champion. Um, and think about something lucky that's happened to you. So to yourself or to a friend or a family member, work related or not. And what might you or they have done prior to that lucky occurrence that increased their chances of luck? Was it luck alone or did actually something happen that inspired that look to happen or it inspired you to consider that look as an opportunity okay so it's not just about the occurrence alone or the chance the chance alone it's about you or whoever being prepared what happened just before that was it bravery was it courageousness or courage what was it what was that thing that really spurred that spurred that person on to to grab that uh, opportunity by by both hands often it's not about just about luck alone Sometimes it's about risk. So the fact that if you are able to to take risk and put yourself in, put yourself out there and really explore what's possible, that's where the magic happens in, in relation to uh, positive and chance chance happenings. And as I mentioned before, very rarely is career path linear. Actually, as I mentioned before, non-linear career paths and portfolio careers train lots of different uh, jobs 
trying lots of different career paths, but actually that could be your strength. Okay. So actually the first picture there, it's very unlikely that it's stepped and then downward. It's not like that. Actually, it's more of a more of this sort of topsy turvy left hand, right hand, up and down diagram where we where we try lots of different things and we put in we face adversity, but we we look for the opportunities within them. And what that allows us to do, as the final picture suggests, is become more equipped, develop skills, grow as a person as well. And that's really important too. So one of our final uh, parts is around recruitment and selection, preparing you for, for that. The first thing I want to do is just translate a bit of terminology for you. So a lot of uh, students and graduates ask me, well, what kind of jobs are out there? What kind of jobs? And there are three main types. Uh, there's the graduate scheme or graduate program and traineeship. There's a graduate job and a job. OK, so what do these things mean? How are they different? So usually with a graduate scheme, a graduate program or a traineeship, you're not applying for a particular job role. You are applying for a place on that scheme. OK, and usually that scheme, it will depend from company to company, but it could be anything from one to three years long. And really, it's a training opportunity. They're taking you in your the sort of the, the current skills and the approach and the experience that you have right now. And they're training you. To, do, to either stay with the organisation or to do a particular role, OK? And it might be as part of that scheme, there's a rotation. So let's say in the first year, um, the first 12 months, you might do four three-month rotations in different sort of um, departments in the organisation or different competencies or different uh, specialisms. And then you might be able to then train and get a really good overview of what the different elements are, but also decide which one you, you'd be interested in taking forward. And it might be for the subsequent year or two years after that of your graduate scheme, it might be you're able to specialise in that particular uh, area as well. Graduate jobs are a little bit different. A graduate job, you will be applying to do a particular job. There will be a job title, which is obviously different to a graduate scheme where you're applying for the scheme. A graduate job, you're applying for a particular job, but we are looking for somebody, as the name suggests, with a degree or postgraduate degree. OK, so this is where you will be doing one particular task. There's, there might be an option, an option two or an opportunity to try different things, but really you are hired to do a particular role within the organisation. But they are looking for somebody who's been to university. And finally, job or entry level role. This is just a what people say is just a job, but it's not just a job. It's an entry level role. But people say basically it's 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 the job that doesn't necessarily require a degree that you can apply for. Now, some some graduates and students think, well, I've got a degree. Well, why, why would I apply for an entry level role? Well, it might be that you are competing for that job, that role for somebody with 10 years more experience than you, but just doesn't have a degree. So your degree is still important because your degree perhaps is your way to demonstrate that you've got as much skills and experience as the other person, just from a slightly different background. OK, so a degree is still important, but it's again down to you to utilise your degree to demonstrate that you've got the skills and the attitude required for that entry level role. And it might be entry level roles sometimes start at the bottom and work your way up. Sometimes they can be at any level. OK, but don't necessarily require a degree to apply for them. But this is where you would use your degree to, to evidence your eligibility to apply. Where to look? Where can I look for opportunities? Here are a few places that you could look. So LinkedIn, Prospects, Milkround, Jobs.ac.uk, Target Jobs. For local local jobs, you've got local gov jobs, City of York Council, um, sort of nationwide jobs. You've got the Guardian jobs, for example. For more specific um, roles, for example, in, in STEM, so science, technology, engineering, and maths, for example. Um, you, you look on Gradcracker, um, and uh, of course. Um, uh, Launchpad Online, which is the university's own career platform, which is a really great place to start for opportunities. Obviously, the majority of them are local um, that we post on there. However, there are lots of opportunities across the country and internationally as well. So definitely worth a look on Launchpad Online first. You might also want to look for particular sectors. So, for example, if you're looking for um, 
I don't know, roles in medicine or management or design or TV, you might want to look at um, the prospect's job profiles because they will often give you specific websites, specialist websites to look on to find opportunities in that particular sector. So what you could do is go on to um, to go to Google, type in prospect job profiles, click on that and you can order them either uh, A to Z to so get the whole list, A to Z as the name suggests, or what you can do is um, organise them by sector. So if you're not particular about a particular job, you're not interested in a particular job, but you're interested in a, in a sector, you can then click the sector and explore all the different jobs that are available within that sector. And then each one of those roles will have its own profile and give you some really important and valuable insights into where you could look for those opportunities as well. So when you start applying for a job, okay, what is the first step? What are you likely to be asked for? Well, either the chances are you'll be asked for either a CV and a cover letter or an online application and supporting statement. OK. In short, both of these things, the content is often the same. So the content that you would include in your CV would be the same as the online application and the information that would be in your cover letter is very similar to what you would what would be in your supporting statement. Your CV and online application on one hand, should be tailored towards the sector or the industry that you are applying to. The cover letter and the supporting statement should be in direct response to the person specification for the specific role that you're applying for. And you should really, certainly at the starting point, be writing a different cover letter or supporting statement for each role that you apply for, because the, the requirements and the skills and the competencies that employees are looking for will be different with each role that you apply for. Now, we can give you some guidance and feedback on your documents. Just email uh, careers at yorksj.ac.uk. If you send us a copy of either your CV, cover letter, your application, we can give you some feedback and guidance directly. So therefore, you can be as confident when you do submit your application that it's the best it possibly can be and you're not underselling yourself, basically. Um, the next stage might be sort of the, after, after the initial application will be shortlisting. So that might be done by sort of interview. Um, so it could be a pre-recorded video where you go on to a, you send a link to a portal, you go on and record your answers to basically to no one, to a machine, to, to a web page, and your recorded videos are then sent to the uh, the organisation for um, for review. What we do know from uh, from a lot of the, the meetings that we've been to regarding uh, graduate employment is that virtual recruitment is here to stay, because actually um, during COVID during the pandemic, companies have found that actually now they've started onboarding and become very confident in, of, of interviewing and on, onboarding uh, new candidates uh, and successful candidates into the business online. They found that actually it's a really good way of doing it, really efficient way of doing it. So they might uh, offer a blended approach. Um, it might be that there's a, a live video interview. So, for example, on Teams or on Skype or on Zoom, for example, and it might also be face to face. Now, the types of interview could vary. So it could be strengths based, which focuses on basically the strengths that you have um, and competency based, based on the competencies of the role that are found in the person's specification. What I would say, regardless of what kind of interview it is, whether it's strengths or competency based, understanding what the company are looking for, uh, what their values are, what their mission statement is, what your motivation for applying are, a role really important key parts of the, uh, the interview and application stages. You might be invited to an assessment centre, so that might consist of an interview, some uh, psychometric tests could be online, it could be paper, um, competency based activities, so you could be asked to do a presentation, a role play, some group work, a group discussion, written tests, and usually they're aligned to the requirements of the role as well. So one example could be an in-tray exercise where you've given a task that you would be doing as part of that role and they sort of assess how, how well that you do in response to that. Uh, the Institute of Student Employers uh, Assessment Centre intentions, based on the facts that we've got, are 45% of the employers intend to continue doing virtual, 25% sort of a hybrid of the two, 25% are still reviewing things, are still undecided, and just 2% are actually right now committing to face-to-face -to -face assessment centres. So it gives you some indication of what employees are going to be looking for and how you can then use this insight to tailor and practice ready for those stages. So whether you are writing a CV, a cover letter, your application, your supporting statement or preparing for interviews, there are three things that you are looking to 
understand and to focus on. And the first thing is understanding what they are looking for. What I would say is a gap, so a vacancy, a gap in a business that you're applying for is a problem, okay? It's a problem for the organization. They need to fill that gap. That's the reason they've gone out to hire is because there's gaps in their organization. So what I would say is think about how could you pitch yourself as your solution, as, as the solution to that gap? to that problem, okay? Understand what they're looking for from the person specification, from their values, from their mission statement, from uh, from an event that you've been to, insight that you've got, looking at the job description, all this information, understanding what they're looking for. Now, further to that, thinking about what are your most relevant skills and how can you evidence them? So in response to what they're looking for and in response to you pitching yourself in your application or your interview as the solution, as a good solution to that problem, to the, to, to the gap in the industry, think about how you can discuss and articulate your skills with experience in response to that. Okay, so think about the skills that you do as part of your degree, lots of other experiences, look at your key skills and attributes mind map like we did before. How can we evidence those things? And hopefully through working through that activity, you should have some evidence, some examples um, of when you have demonstrated those key skills and think about even further so for example when I mentioned when I was a kitchen designer and I want to evidence um, problem solving skills what particular example can I give specific example one example that happened or several examples that have happened within that role that I can use to demonstrate that I've got that skill and as I mentioned previously, it's, it's the wider understanding of the organisation, the challenges that they face. Who are they? What are their values, mission statement? Who are their clients? Okay, who are their competitors? Why do you want to work with this organisation in particular? These are the three areas that you really need to be focusing on as part of your application, your CVs, your cover letters, your interviews. Okay, this is the secret to really good quality considered applications. So from the ISE, so we went to a, recently went to a, a conference with the ISE. These are the takeaways that we, we took away from, from what they said. And the Institute of Student Employers is the voice of, uh, of the student employers. So what they said was, you are not defined by your degree. So what I would say is, further to what I said earlier, decide what you are hoping to do with your career and how you can utilise your degree to support you to do what you want to do. They also recommended know who we are, know who the company are, know what they do as a, as a minimum. But think about who their competitors are, what their values are. Too often, people go to interviews way underprepared and they can't even sort of articulate what the organisation do as a minimum. Be curious, be able to ask questions and don't be afraid to say I don't know. Graduate roles, um, for the most part, are, are training, are training programmes, okay? So, you evidence and demonstrate that you've got the minimum requirements or you're eligible to to do the role you will learn lots ask lots of questions and don't be afraid to say i don't know but be reflective think about um how you can reflect on your own performance and the skills that you've got and how you can grow off the back of that as well show your learning agility so learn agility is basically what you do when you don't know what to do okay how do you respond to that how do you learn how do you approach that, that challenge? Seek feedback as well. Again, that links to growth moving forward. And don't let application panic dilute your chances. It's that sort of 100 applications in a weekend versus 10 applications in a weekend. 10 is probably still too much, okay? But think about how you can uh, opt for quality over quantity. And the final thing they said is we're just people doing our jobs wanting you to succeed. Wanting you to succeed. We were once in your shoes. So what I would say is try not to focus too much on the things that you can't control, the fact that you need to go to a job interview, the fact that job interviews are a bit uncomfortable and a bit scary, but focus on the things that you can control, like writing a really good quality application, doing lots of research into organisations and really understand what they're looking for and articulating how you can support them to do that within your interview and your applications. We've also got some really interested and handy guide so you go to prospects the cv guide the cover letter guide we've also got some videos on uh, launchpad on youtube so if you can search for ysj launchpad there's a video on application theory preparing for job interviews and we've got a, a further overview of graduate schemes uh, graduates first uh, is also a great place to practice psychometric tests as well um 
and you can also there's also some extra videos on our youtube channel on building your confidence and resilience and tackling imposter syndrome as well so really handy resources there so in final final sorry in in summary finally and um, we've reached sort of reached the end or towards the end of our presentation today top tips if you've got no idea what to do next the first one is start with yourself think about the the, the first step of the dots model understand what your skills and strengths are and what your version of success is okay seek opportunities for inspiration ask people attend events look on linkedin look on the prospect job profiles speak to people that you know okay look at lots of different places the key part of the dots model is opportunities okay and at that point just look 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 for jobs that you're interested in and will be interested and inspired in researching further Use your network as well. Ask questions. A lot of the prospect job profiles have case studies on there as well. So do have a look at those. What do people you know like or dislike about their jobs? Who do they work with? Who are their clients? What can you learn from them? Explore and research. I can't stress that enough. Use labour market information um, to, to, to guide you in, in the jobs that are available. And consider completing the Certificate in Careers Thinking, which is available on Moodle. It's a short course. It usually takes between nine and ten hours to complete, but it's a really good opportunity to explore all the topics that we've covered today uh, further. And the final thing what you could do, consider doing is, is a SWOT analysis. So looking at your strengths, your weaknesses, your opportunities and your threats. And that will really help you to understand where you are at the moment, the opportunities uh, for development and the areas that you could improve on. Looking at the types of roles that are available and think about the things that could stand in your way and uh, help you to consider ways of overcoming those to help you to move towards your sort of next challenge and your next career goal. And the final thing I'd like you to do is think about planning yourself uh, three goals uh, following the session. So based on what we've covered today, what I'd like you to do is plan and uh, create one short term goal that you'd like to achieve within a month. I'd like you to um, write one medium term goal to be achieved within six months and one longer term goal to be achieved within 12 months. OK, based on what we've discussed today, I'd like to think about all the things that you need to do. Whether there are a few things or there, there, whether there are a few small things or a few big things, that's fine. There's plenty of time. It's not a race. OK, but maybe consider taking this time to plan yourself some goals on how you're going to move forward. So that's everything for today's session. It's been so great to be here with you and to be able to talk through this session, give you all the knowledge and the support that uh, you might need to help you to move forward more confidently. Of course, this isn't the only session that you can join. Obviously, check on uh, Launch Online for further sessions that you might want to attend to. And you can also book an appointment with a careers advisor to talk about your own plans in much more detail. Well, thank you so much for listening. I'm so excited to, to speak to you and hear about how you get on and the ideas you've got for the future. And remember, you can do it. It might feel like a big task now, but by following the, the prompts and the activities during this session, you've already made a really fantastic start in achieving your next career goals. But remember, we're here to support you and career support from York and John University is for life. So we're going absolutely nowhere. So thank you for today. Thank you for listening and I hope to speak to you soon.